open to allowing Iran to retain thousands of them. Iran's supreme leader even said recently that they need a larger enrichment capability than the one they currently have. Another thing that's happened as part of this extension is that they and the P5 plus one countries are going to allow Iran to access another $2.8 billion in sanctions relief. So basically, what they've done here is they've forced the hand of this extension and they get even more relief as a result of it. I'm also worried that the administration seems willing to allow Iran to have even more than four months to provide simple answers about its past work on nuclear weapons. If they're not even willing to come clean on what they've done in the past, how can we possibly treat them as a reliable and responsible actor? Uh, beyond that, there seems to be no attention whatsoever played to the need to address Iran's ballistic missile program, its ICBMs. And there's only one reason why you have ICBMs. And that is, these are long-range rockets capable of one day reaching the United States as they continue to develop it. The only reason you would even have one of those is to put a nuclear warhead on it. And just imagine a world where Iran has nuclear weapons capable of reaching this very city or New York or any part of the continental United States. It would be all-out chaos. They would now have to be treated very differently, and they would basically be able to act with impunity anywhere in the world. And that reaches my last point. Absent in this whole conversation and in all these negotiations is any discussion about Iran's ongoing sponsorship of terrorism and their ongoing human rights violations, including a pastor, an American, being held uh, uh, with, with strong links to this country, being held unjustly in that country. All this to say that this is the reason why this bill is so important. Any final agreement of a matter of this consequence should be reviewed by this body, should come before Congress, and should have the ability of Congress to provide oversight over it. And the absence of that, I believe, unfortunately, leaves us vulnerable not just to a terrible deal, but to a dangerous one that could potentially endanger the future of our allies and even of our own country. So I'm grateful in joining with these senators, and, and I don't know uh, who would want to speak on this next. I know all of my colleagues. I know the senator from Arizona has spent a tremendous amount of time sounding the alarm on the danger, not just of this deal, but that Iran poses in the region. And I would be interested in hearing from the senator from Arizona on his views with, about this extension. Well, senator I thank the senator from Florida, and I thank him for his advocacy for democracy and freedom throughout the world. And frankly, I am very been very incredibly impressed with his knowledge in depth, including in our own hemisphere, which I think he and I would agree has been very much ignored, and there's enormous challenges ahead uh, there as well. I just, I just asked a couple of questions of my friend from Tennessee and my friend from South Carolina. Uh, isn't it true that in order to have a true nuclear capability, you have to have a warhead and you have to have a, miss a delivery system and the Iranians are proceeding apace forward in acquiring those capabilities? And would anybody believe that if they were truly interested in not going to nuclear weapons, they would not be spending time and effort on that uh, capability? Does, doesn't that make a credible, uh, destroy any credibility they might have about a commitment to not continue the development of nuclear weapons? Well, I would say that if there was a group of people in the world to be suspicious of, I would put Iran pretty close to the top of that list. The international intelligence community believes that they have tried to militarize their uh, program, nuclear program in the past, and Senator Rubio made a good point. They deny this, but before you go forward, you'd want to answer that question. Were they engaged in militarization of what was claimed to be a peaceful nuclear power program? Secondly, why would you go through all of this upheaval, build a nuclear power plant secretly at the bottom of a mountain if all you wanted to do was have peaceful nuclear power? None of this really adds up. And why do you need an ICBM if all you want to do is produce peaceful nuclear power? Having said that, Suspicion is uh, warranted here, but more than anything else, the final deal that may be reached should come to this body because I would suggest that of all the problems in the world today, this is the top of the list for me. If they did break out like North Korea, if a bad deal turned into a dangerous deal just like North Korea, Sunni Arabs would respond in kind and you're on the road to Armageddon. I can't think of a worse scenario 
for our national security than the Ayatollahs with nukes. I can't think of a more direct threat to the survival of the state of Israel than Ayatollahs in Iran with nukes. I can't believe the Sunni Arabs would allow the Shia Persians to have a nuclear capability unanswered. I would ask my friend from Tennessee, is it, was he surprised and shocked that there would be an extension of these negotiations? Was he shocked and surprised that the uh, end date is now after the midterm elections that we have here in the United States of America? Was he shocked that the, uh, even though there has not been, quote, sufficient progress, there was still a more relaxation of the sanctions, which then gives the Iranians billions of dollars worth of uh, a boost to their economy? Was he surprised and shocked that this extension took place? Uh, obviously, as the, just the way you answer the question, ask the question, and obviously uh, there's nobody in this, uh, in this Senate body that has spent more time on these issues than you, and I thank you so much for your leadership on both the Armed Services Committee but also on the Foreign Relations Committee on all of these issues, but absolutely not. Uh, uh, you know, when you have a, a deal that's inked that says there's a built-in extension, uh, you, th you know that people aren't going to focus until the very end. And so we expected there to be an extension. I was very disappointed, though, to know that we were giving additional sanctions relief. And I'm very concerned that because of the way this has happened, and as you know, in March, the administration agreed to allowing them to enrich uranium, which was a big setback. I mean, we don't allow our best friends. We, we uh, approved one, two, three agreements. You and I just uh, did one the other day in the committee with Senator Rubio. And by the way, Senator Risch is also uh, a part of this bill. But with our closest friends and allies, we do not approve enrichment. And so here we are. Uh, doing something that's going to really undo many of the agreements that we have and certainly have, as Senator Graham mentioned from South Carolina, a tremendous impact on the region. I mean, there's no question people on the Arabian Peninsula right across the strait are looking at a country that has been their foe and looking at potentially them having the capability to enrich uranium. And yes, um, this, is, this agreement started in a very bad place, but I think all of us, we want to see a diplomatic solution. We want this to be successful. I would add, Rouhani has the supreme leader that he has to go back and talk to. He can always use that. Supreme leader, as Senator Graham mentioned, wants 100,000 centrifuges, not the 19,000 centrifuges they have. I would just say for our administration to have us as a backstop where Congress has to approve this would actually be an aid to them as they move down this negotiating path. And so I look at this as an asset to them, and I look at, at, at us fulfilling our responsibilities if this bill becomes law. But thank you for asking. Finally, could I ask the senator from Florida? We judge nations by their behavior, I believe. In fact, we don't view them in a vacuum. Uh, I, for example, uh, the President of the United States said that if Syria crossed the red line in the use of chemical weapons, we would have to respond, and obviously we didn't. Meanwhile, 170,000 people have been slaughtered, huge percentage of those men, women, and children. So isn't it appropriate for us to not <coughs> look at the Iranians in a very narrow spectrum, but overall behavior going all the way back to the Beirut bomb, uh, bombing the barracks in Beirut, the USS Cole attempts to, to kill the U.S. plot to kill the Saudi ambassador here, maybe most worst of all the Revolutionary Guard that's gone into Syria and the incredible flow of weapons and training by, on the part of the Iranians, uh, which has turned the tide in favor of, of Bashar Assad. What about the Iranian missiles that are now, some of which are threatening and raining down on Israel? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we understand better? Shouldn't the American people and the world understand better what we're dealing with here? A, a, a country with leaders who are dedicated to uh, the extinction of everything we stand for and believe in. So therefore, wouldn't that impact our calculations as to their sincerity about 
a, a, a nuclear weapons program? I think the senator from Arizona touches on the exact point. And first of all, we have to understand that Iran is the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. No nation on earth uses terrorism as an act of form of statecraft the way that they do. They, they use terrorism the way we use, you know, our military forces when necessary. They, they view it as a very active part of their agenda. And so you're right, virtually every major terrorist organization in, in the Middle East, uh, absent a couple, they've provided extraordinary assistance to. And, and I think you touched on another point. What is their goal here? That's important to understand. What is the Iranian goal in these negotiations? And in my mind, those goals are quite clear. And in fact, it's shocking to me because I know the administration knows this as well. The goal of Iran on this is pretty simple. They want relief from as many sanctions as possible without agreeing to any irreversible concessions on their nuclear program. And let's go through what they've been able to achieve. They want to be able to retain or, or achieve a, an internationally recognized right to enrich. Check. They want the capability to enrich and reprocess in the future and keep as much of that in place as possible. They've already gotten that. Check. They want to continue to develop their long-range rockets and missile capabilities so that one day they can be in that position where when we negotiate with them in the future on anything else, they're untouchable because they can launch a nuclear attack against the United States and certainly against our allies. They continue to do that. Check. So the Iranians in this whole negotiation view themselves as being in a position of strength. To be quite frank, they believe that our president wants this deal more than they do. They believe he wants this deal more than they do. And, and that's, a, that's what puts them in this tremendous position of strength. And, and the result is that these negotiations are not going to, in my view, I, I hope that I'm wrong. I hope that tomorrow we open up and read, you know what, they've changed their mind. They don't want to do any more terrorism, no more rockets, and no nuclear weapon program. And they've become just a normal government in a normal country. Don't hold your hopes out for that. Because that is not what they've shown in the past. That is not what they're doing now. And they are negotiating from a position of strength because they believe that the president wants a deal much more than they want or need a deal. So I would ask, again, bring, going full circle to the senator from South Carolina, wouldn't we actually be helping the administration at the negotiating table to say, wait a minute, uh, we've got a Congress full of uh, people who have spent a lot of time on this issue and are very skeptical and want, are going to have to be convinced of this deal. Wouldn't we actually be strengthening the United States' hand at the bargaining table in your view, if something of this magnitude that Congress would have to, to be involved in. I think... As we have other major treaties that have been made, and some of them much less significant right. than this agreement. The answer unequivocally to me would be yes, assuming one thing, that those of us in this body would handle this in a mature fashion. Assuming that Republicans would not vote no because it's the Obama deal and Democrats would not be tempted to vote yes because their president did this, a Democratic president. I have confidence in the body that we would not do that. And let me tell you why. There are a lot of treaties out there, Senator McCain, that affect our national security. I can't think of an event in my lifetime that's going to affect our national security one way or the other greater than the Iranian nuclear deal that I think is coming. If a Republican scuttled the deal that was good, you would have a very unique place in history because you would have done a disservice to our country and the world at large. Is it possible to know it is a good deal? Yes, because the Israelis would comment on it. The Sunni Arab world would comment on it. And if it's truly a deal unlike North Korea that led to a bad outcome, I think you would have a course of people, including me, that would acknowledge that the president did the world a great service. If it is a bad deal, if Senator Rubio is right that they want to check the box and get a deal for the sake of getting a deal, I hope my Democratic colleagues would stand up and say, this will come back to bite us as a nation. I have confidence the body can do this, Senator McCain, because I can't think of anything more serious we will vote on other than going to war. Well, I'd like to thank uh, the senator from Tennessee. And uh, as the uh, senator from South Carolina uh, noted, the relationship that exists between the senator from Tennessee and the senator from New Jersey, 
I believe has reinvigorated the Foreign Relations Committee in a very uh, incredible way. And uh, what has taken place, thanks to that bipartisanship and hard work, has really been some remarkable results. And frankly, we've been able, thanks to your leadership and that of the chairman, to have a significant impact on the conduct of national security in what I would argue is probably the greatest turmoil in my lifetime. So I want to thank the senator from Tennessee for his great work. And if I could, Senator, I, I, you know, since you and I have worked together on the committee, the administration came to us when they didn't have to. They came to us on the authorization for the use of force in Syria. We came together over a very short amount of time, Democrats and Republicans, and crafted something that I'm very proud of. Uh, it didn't end up coming to the floor because a different course of action uh, was taken. But the fact is, the administration sought our input on something that, as the senator from South Carolina just mentioned, may pale compared to the impact of this Ira Iranian negotiation relative to nuclear arms. So, so this is something that's, I think, very, very important. I agree with the senator from South Carolina. I agree that if something is presented, we would act very much in the same manner. It would be a sober discussion. People would understand the importance of it. And I think from the administration standpoint, uh, the Senate saying grace over it and approving it gives him additional buy-in from the American people that we're behind him if they negotiate a good deal. And on the other hand, if they don't, obviously we should have the right to, to weigh in and keep uh, the sanctions that have been put in place by us from being waived. Everybody says, well, the administration still has to come back and talk with you all about sanctions. That's not true. There's a waiver provision in there. They can't be undone permanently, but I think it gives us the appropriate uh, say-so. I thank you so much uh, for your leadership and for everybody's time on the floor and in working on this. And hopefully, as you mentioned, this will be some become something that's very bipartisan. I yield the floor.